One of the biggest concerns that you might have read about or heard about when it comes to soy is that soy contains estrogen, which, as speculated, could negatively affect female estrogen or magically make men more feminine. This is one of the most flawed misconceptions about soy in soybeans, other legumes, and other foods contain phytoestrogens. And phytoestrogens are not the same thing as human estrogen. Hello and welcome to the Health Wizard Podcast. I'm your host, Yelena Isoldi Medici, a health and life coach. I'm so excited that you're choosing to listen to my podcast because you are choosing to make your health your priority. The Health Wizard Podcast is dedicated to teaching natural, easy to implement practices that you can use to get your health on track and become the person you used to be before getting sick and the person you're dreaming of becoming again, happy, healthy, full of energy and living a life filled with joy. Now, very quickly, before we dive into the good stuff, I want to remind you that this podcast is intended for education and entertainment purposes only. This podcast is not a substitute for professional medical advice. If you have a medical condition, please seek the help of a licensed medical professional. I am not a medical doctor. I do not treat, diagnose, prescribe, or make claims outside of my areas of expertise. So by choosing to listen to the Health Wizard podcast, you take full responsibility for your own actions. And when you hear the testimonials of the people who were able to get well, realize that their outcomes depended on their effort and their specific situation. With that said, let's jump into today's episode. Please enjoy. Hello, beautiful. Welcome to the Health Wizard podcast. I hope that you're ready for another amazing episode where I can give you the tools that you need in order to get educated to resolve the symptoms of hormone, thyroid, autoimmune conditions, and pretty much any other health issue or weight loss problem that you're struggling with. Today, we're going to dive into the topic that seems to create a lot of controversy in uh, health and nutrition circles, and it does so only because there's a lot of misinformation about this very topic and a lot of great but bad advertisement that is pushed by interested groups against soy products. If you listen to the mainstream media, to some nutritionists, to health advocates, you're going to hear it everywhere. Oh my God, soy is bad for you. Stop eating it. You're going to grow men boobs if you're a man. If you're going to, if you're a woman, you're going to have a bigger hormone imbalance, but nothing can be further from the truth. The question, of course, is to eat soy or not to eat soy. That seems to be the question of the day, especially when you have thyroid or hormone issues if you're into bodybuilding, or if you're into being a human being. So what's the controversy surrounding soy? What's true? What's not? What should we worry about? And what should we disregard? So let's talk about that today. Now, before exploring any topic, I suggest that we approach it from this perspective. What does the history say about this topic? What does the common sense say to us about this? Where does the money trail lead when it comes to scientific discoveries? Who stands to benefit from proving something as bad or good? And of course, essentially at the end, we're going to look at what does the science say? And remember, I'm not against science. I love science. I'm a scientist myself, but science, especially health science, can after it be sold to the man or woman with the biggest purse. So as we jump into this topic today, I want you to keep those questions in mind. So when we are evaluating this topic, you're coming from a holistic approach point rather than I heard something that's bad for me, must be bad for me without actually looking into the facts. Now, quick disclaimer, I am not promoting or discouraging soy consumption with this podcast. I simply want to set the facts straight so that once you're in the know, you can make your own decision about what is good for you. I personally have been consuming soy as a part of a well-rounded plant-based diet for over 10 years, and it had not prevented me or any of my clients from reversing a hormone imbalance, an autoimmune condition, or a thyroid condition. 
Now, with that, I have to say that I do not, absolutely do not eat extracts of heavily processed soy products, which you're going to find in a lot of dressings. It's added into meats. If you're uh, omnivore and if you're eating meat products, is been added to your uh, meats. So that means cows, sheep, whatever you're eating, uh, chicken to their feed to plump them up. So one way or another, whether you're pro or against, so you have been consuming it in that way. Right now, I am not going to ask you to arrive at my conclusion, but by the end of this podcast, I'm going to give you enough evidence to create your own conclusion based on facts and common sense, as opposed to some hyped up articles and videos or whatever you might have gotten your information from. Soy allergies are real for some people. They are not to be dismissed. So if you have a soy allergy, I still want you to enjoy this podcast, but please do not go and consume soy. Soy allergies, however, are not as common in people as we are told that they are. So with these disclaimers in mind and these warnings ahead of time, I want us to dive into today's topic. Now, while we tend to think that soy is a staple food in all of the Asian countries, I have grown up in Central Asia where soy was not a major food source. Most of the soy consumption is observed in China, Singapore, Hong Kong, Japan, uh, the Korean countries, so in, in multiple countries, but not everywhere. There in those countries, soy is consumed in many ways, most of which do not even closely resemble how soy is produced and consumed in the United States or some of the so-called developed countries. In soy-consuming populations, soybeans are boiled, soy is made into tofu, into fermented tofu, miso, soy milk, soy flour, and a few other delicacies. While it is processed into a few different soy products, soybean remains largely unaltered. It's just the shape that it changes, but there are no soy extracts that had been created for centuries past as this people in these countries had consumed this soy products. Chinese certainly did not think of making soy into Boca burgers, soy formula, or energy bars when they had been consuming soy for thousands of years now. This badge of honor will stay with the developed societies, as we call them. Soy has been consumed in multiple cultures for thousands of years, providing a great source of nutrition. Chinese and Japanese populations before they were introduced to the Western way of eating were thinner, healthier, and enjoyed a longer lifespan. Japanese life expectancy is almost 85 years compared to the U.S. life expectancy of only 78 to 79 years. If you look at the world cancer statistics, USA holds the seventh place on the list of 50 countries with the highest overall cancer rates in the world with 300.2 cases per each 100,000 people of the population in our country, while Japan and China did not even make the list. Now, as we're going through the podcast, by the way, if you want to get this scientific references that I'm using in this episode, you can go to the blog post on my website to get all of those references that will be provided. So what is soy and why does it seem to draw so much controversy? Soy is a bean. That's it. However, its nutritional content places it somewhere between a legume and a nut. For example, if you look at pinto beans, Pinto beans have only 4% fat content, 24% protein, and 75% carbohydrate. While when you compare it to soy, it's 41% fat, 35% protein, and 31% carbohydrate. Compare that to a peanut, which is 61% fat, 17% protein, and only 2% carbohydrate. So it's right somewhere in between. One of the biggest concerns that you might have read about or heard about when it comes to soy is that soy contains estrogen, which as speculated could negatively affect female estrogen or magically make men more feminine or have them grow man boobs. This is one of the most flawed misconceptions about soy. Soybeans, other legumes, and other foods do contain phytoestrogens, not estrogens that are found in the human body. The reason phytoestrogens are called such is because their molecular structure is similar to that of estradiol, a major hormone in women. 
Because of this, people who do not understand biochemistry erroneously concluded that consumption of soy is dangerous, claiming that soy and soy foods will elevate estrogen levels in humans, thus increasing the risk of breast and other cancers. Luckily, other foods which contain phytoestrogen, often even in higher amounts than soy, have been left off of the list at least for now. Otherwise, flaxseed, which is often recommended for improving bowel movements due to its high fiber content, would be a food to avoid too. Interestingly, flaxseeds carry a whopping three times the amount of phytoestrogen found in soy, sesame seeds, garlic, and even sprouts. If you want to see soy content in some of these products, head on over to my blog post for this podcast and you're going to see a chart for that. So I think it is a good time to start asking why soy has been singled out. Phytoestrogens bind to estrogen receptors in the body. However, they are almost a thousand times weaker than human estradiol. This binding attachment to estrogen receptors, however, may exert a protective effect. So not a negative, but a protective effect Weaker plant-based phytoestrogens can block the attachment of stronger human estrogen, which is known to increase the risk of cancer and other cancers. Further investigation of plant foods shows that unlike human estrogen, phytoestrogens do not accumulate in the body but pass through within a matter of hours. So eating soy, flax seeds, garlic, or even apricots does not elevate estrogen levels in the body. What does elevate them is the consumption of animal foods, lack of fiber in a diet, alcohol consumption, and carrying too much body fat. This should be the first factors to consider by those who want to keep estrogen levels in the normal protective range. Now, there's another thing to consider, and that is isoflavins. Isoflavins are phytonutrients found in soy and other legumes. They serve as antioxidants in the body. By now, we all know that antioxidants have a protective effect. In addition to phytoestrogens, other isoflavins include glycine, daisine, and genistein, all of which are found in specific ratios in whole organic soy foods. In consumption of genetically engineered soy products, on the other hand, it is problematic. Studies have shown that isoflavins make up of genetically engineered soy is different than that of organic soy. Let's take it further. As I mentioned earlier, eating a whole soy product is very different than eating extracts because the whole is always better than the parts. The nature itself intended for foods to be consumed in a way they're growing or as close to the natural state of food as possible, not as extracts. If isoflavins are good for us when consumed in whole foods, including soy, it does not mean that isoflavin supplements will have the same beneficial effect on the body. When the body is presented with an unnatural substance, such as an isolate of soy in this case, it reacts differently than it would to the whole foods. Yet, isolates are frequently used in studies, often leading to flawed findings. Because of this, those who conduct studies often misinterpret this data. They fail to realize that if they use whole foods, in this case soybeans, in a study they might actually get different outcomes than when they use isolates. While whole foods are beneficial with their full complexity, extract of any foods, including soy, are often useless at best and harmful at worst. Recent studies have shown just how useless multivitamins are on preventing or reversing health issues. The story is no different when it comes to food extracts, isolates, in this case, of course, soy isolates. In the last couple of decades, the American markets have exploded with soy products and byproducts, anything ranging from imitation meat and imitation dairy products to supercharged shakes and bars stuffed with food isolates. While they are perceived as a healthier option, they are called health food, most frequently than not, they are not. Manufacturing process removes minerals, 
phytochemicals, dietary fiber, healthy fats, which are naturally found in plants, and vitamins or other great plant chemicals, which are found in natural plants, but not in isolates. These isolates, in some cases, an example would be soy protein, are mixed with various heavily processed ingredients, including sugar, salt, oils, artificial sweeteners, eggs, dairy proteins, wheat protein, and so on and so forth, to create fake replicas of meat and dairy products or to create protein shakes. You can find soy isolates in many processed foods, including salad dressings, candy bars, yogurts, ice cream, baked goods, cheeses, mayonnaise, and many other food and even non-food items. While soy itself is a whole and a healthy food, these items that are used in isolates should never top the list of healthy items or be found in your kitchen, except on rare occasion when you might want to treat. It is interesting to note that the cultures we discussed earlier, namely China and Japan and Korea's, which use soy regularly, did not make the list of 50 countries with the highest overall cancer rates in the world. America, on the other hand, which uses a lot of processed soy and processed junk overall, is at the top of the list. Now, let's take it a step further. Let's also look at the studies that were created around soy products. You'll be surprised to find out that many of the studies concerning soy products involve animals, not humans. Now, maybe it's news to some, but our biochemistry is different than that of the animals, even though in some ways it might be similar. Combine this with using isolated nutrients, and it is no wonder that there is so much confusion, not only about soy, but about other foods and extracts and whole foods as well. Studies performed involving human subjects and whole soy products often point to exactly the opposite outcomes as compared to any fear-mongering you might have heard until now. So let's talk about science, shall we? What does the science say about soy? I'm going to give you 13 different studies, and if you want to see exact references, you want to head on over to the blog post that comes along with this podcast. I'm going to give you 13 studies, which are going to give you 13 reasons why, unless you're allergic, you can actually embrace and enjoy soy. In these specific studies, human subjects were used as opposed to animal subjects. First one is called the diet and androgens, also known as the Diana trial. This trial involved 104 postmenopausal women with elevated levels of testosterone and estradiol, consuming a Western diet. They were placed on a diet low in animal fat and refined carbohydrates, rich in low glycemic index foods, monosaturated and uh, polyunsaturated fatty acids and phytoestrogens to see if the hormone profile of postmenopausal women could be changed to reduce the risk of postmenopausal breast cancer. They were placed on a diet that comprised of meat, eggs, and dairy consumed only once per week, so reduced animal intake, reduced consumption of refined carbohydrates, increased consumption of whole grains, legumes, vegetables, cruciferous vegetables, and fruit, and almost two servings of soy per day, an average of 1.7 also including flax seeds every day, which are high in phytoestrogens, seaweed every other day in their dishes. Only four and a half months later, here were the results. There was a reduction of insulin resistance and increase of insulin sensitivity, reduced cholesterol levels from an average of 240 down to 205, an average of about eight pounds of weight loss, Serum sex hormone binding globulin levels increased by up to 25%. So overall outstanding outcomes. There are also epidemiologic studies of isoflovins in mammographic density. In January of 2008, researchers at the University of Southern California found that women averaging one cup of soy milk or about one half cup of tofu daily have about a 30% less risk of developing breast cancer compared to women who have little or no soy products in their diets. Now, one thing to note here, 
adding a cup of soy milk or tofu to a poor diet is not likely to be protective against cancers. Normally, people who consume soy products are more health conscious than those who do not. They use less or no animal products, which would lead to the positive effects of their diet, including soy products in their, on their overall health. Study number three. A study published in the Journal of the American Medical Association in 2009 showed that soy products may reduce the risk of cancer recurrence. In a group of over 5,000 women previously diagnosed with breast cancer who were participating in the Shanghai Breast Cancer Survival Study over a four-year period, those who regularly consume soy products such as soy, milk, or tofu, or edamame beans, had a 32% low risk of recurrence of cancer and a 29% decreased risk of death compared with women who consume little or no soy. Study number four was a study of Japanese women found that the more soy women ate, the less likely they were to need a hysterectomy. So isoflovin's intake significantly was associated with a decreased risk of premenopausal hysterectomy. Now, of course, the big conversation is uh, out there. Can men have soy? If you've been listening up until now, the answer is, of course, yes. But here is a study for you. 15 placebo-controlled treatment groups with baseline and ending measures were analyzed for men. In addition, 32 reports involving 36 treatment groups were assessed in simpler models to ascertain the results. The results of meta-analysis suggested that neither soy foods nor isoflovin supplements alter measures of bioavailable testosterone concentration in men specifically. So there is no downside in consuming soy. Study number six. An analysis of 14 studies published in the American Journal of Clinical Nutrition showed that increased intake of soy resulted in a 26% reduction in prostate cancer. And researchers found that a 30% reduction with non-fermented soy products such as soy, milk, and tofu was observed. Again, fantastic news, taking you away from fear and bringing you into the reality of whole foods, plant foods are good for you. But let's get you more studies. A randomized double-blind placebo-controlled trial was conducted in 43 women to evaluate the effects of soy isoflovins and serum thyroid profile. The study showed that soy products do not cause hypothyroidism and had no negative effect on thyroid function. I personally was able to fully reverse hypothyroidism without medication while regularly enjoying some soy products. Now, I'm not too crazy on soy, but I do consume it regularly at least once a week. My family consumes it very regularly because they enjoy it in nothing but positive outcomes. Having worked with my clients for over a decade, I had seen no negative outcomes from consuming soy products unless somebody was specifically allergic to soy. With that said, soy isoflovins may take up some of the iodine in the body that would normally be used to make thyroid hormone. The same is true for fiber supplements and some medications. In this case, is adding iodine-rich sea vegetables, so not extracted iodine, to your diet is advisable. Study number eight. There's essentially no evidence from the nine identified clinical studies that isoflovin exposure affects circulating estrogen levels in men. Clinical evidence also indicates that isoflovins have no effect on sperm or semen parameters. And all the men right now listening to this podcast can take a collective exhale because soy isoflovin exposure does not feminize men. Multiple studies pointed to the fact that soy can actually decrease cholesterol levels. The relationship between soy product intake and serum total cholesterol concentration was examined in 1,242 men and 3,596 women in Takayama City, Japan. A significant trend was observed for decreasing total cholesterol concentration within an increase in intake of soy products in men. This negative trend was also noted in women. So negative, that means negative for cholesterol, but positive for our bodies. Let's go to the next study. 
phytoestrogens have both a weak estrogen stimulating estrogenic and paradoxically an estrogen inhibiting anti-estrogenic activity. The estrogen-like activities may strengthen bones and prevent menopausal symptoms like hot flashes. Hot flashes are reported by 70 to 80 percent of U.S. menopausal women compared to only 10 to 14 percent of women in Japan and Singapore. The anti-estrogen activity reduces the risk of breast and uterine cancers. Study number 11. 2,400 Asian American women were studied to determine the role of their dietary pattern played in developing breast cancer. Three dietary patterns were observed, Western meat and starch high diets, ethnic meat and starch based diets, and vegetable soy based diets. Women who consumed the Western and ethnic meat and starch focused diets had the highest risk of breast cancer, while those eating a vegetable soy based diet had the lowest risk. Sex hormone binding globulin levels were 23% lower in women eating the meat starch pattern with low intake of vegetable in soy than in those eating a low meat starch diet with higher soy and vegetable intake. Now, what does that mean? It means that sex hormone binding globulin assists in removing both estrogen and testosterone from the system, therefore reducing the risk of both prostate and breast cancer. Another study was a meta-analysis actually that included five case-controlled and two cohort studies. It included 169,000 women in U.S., China, Italy, and Japan. And 3,500 of them had ovarian and endometrial cancer. Soy intake was measured and based on both food eaten and soy isoflavin intake. In all of these studies, the women who consumed the highest amount of soy had a lower risk of developing endometrial or ovarian cancer as compared to those women who consumed the lowest amounts. Here's one more. A study in 2009 published in the American Journal of Clinical Nutrition concluded that soy intake during adolescence and adulthood may reduce premenopausal breast cancer risk by an average of 40%. Risk reduction was 59% for those with the highest soy intake and 56% of adults with the highest soy isoflavin intake. The study involved 72,000 223 Chinese women in the Shanghai Women's Health Study. It was led by Wei Zeng at Vanderbilt University School of Medicine. The researchers collected data using a food frequency questionnaire and found that soy consumption was associated with a reduced risk. Here's what the study concluded that this large population-based protective cohort study provides strong evidence of a protective effect of soy food intake against premenopausal breast cancer. Women who consumed a high amount of soy food consistently during adolescence and adulthood had a sustainably reduced risk of breast cancer. And that is good news. And of course, that is exactly the opposite of what we have been hearing in the news and the media. Now, there's sometimes a knee-jerk reaction. If soy is good for me, let's go consume all of it. Or, oh my God, let's go consume some supplements that are made of soy. Why don't we? While all of the studies that I just mentioned to you are exciting, remember what I said earlier, that the whole is always better than the parts. According to a study published in 2011, taking soy isoflovins does not reduce bone loss or menopausal symptoms during the first five years of menopause and may actually increase the incidence of hot flashes and constipation. The authors of the study stated that the results are disappointing because estrogen therapy while it is effective in reducing hot flashes, increases the risk of breast cancer and heart attacks and that the risks outweigh the benefits. Researchers would like to find a natural alternative that is safe and effective. Now, I can certainly say that the dietary lifestyle, which I and my clients chose, is that natural alternative. And a sure way to having an uneventful menopause. It is a common thing with my clients when they come to me to start having an improved menstrual cycle, so less PMS. Or if they're going through menopause, they're reducing or completely eliminating menopausal symptoms. Now, in this study, there were 248 women 
they were randomized to take either 200 milligrams per day of soy isoflovin in pills or placebo for five years. So pretty nice and long study. This dose represents about two times the amount of isoflovins consumed daily in food in a typical Asian diet. There were no significant differences in the two groups in terms of bone mineral density of the spine, hip or femoral neck. However, significantly more participants in the isoflovin group experienced hot flashes and constipation than those in the control group getting placebo. The researchers concluded that soy isoflovins were ineffective in preventing bone loss or reducing menopausal symptoms and that they did cause side effects. Now, I had just given you all the positive studies that came uh, in defense of soy, if I were to put it that way. But there's a lot of negative reviews and a lot of negative studies. And this is why you have really, you have to be smart to use your discernment to understand how the studies are built and how they're concluded and who funds the studies. I recently read an article that listed 12 reasons to avoid soy in any form. So I took my time to actually read through every single word in the article, and then I followed every single reference that was used in that article. Well, first of all, the article was poorly written and research was taken out of context. Some parts of studies were cited while others were ignored since they did not seem to benefit the author's narrative. Some studies were cited without a clear connection to the thesis that the author was writing. I found that only those who did not do their homework, and I find that generally, to investigate their references or understand how to interpret them would truly believe what is being written in cases that are making soy out to be a villain. If anyone was cautious enough to pay their due diligence, they would have dismissed any article and any author as being a valid source of information. There were several studies cited in that article that I'm going to pull from right now to take them apart that I'm going to uh, bring to light in this case. One of them was a pilot study which indicated the prolonged soy consumption of soy protein isolate, so pay attention here to the words, has a stimulatory effect on the premenopausal female breast characterized by increased secretion of breast fluid, the appearance of hyperplactic epithelial cells, and elevated levels of plasma estradiol. Now, since it's a concentrated soy isolate, not the actual whole soybean that was used, the study is flawed within itself. It should be redone with whole foods and average soy intake in mind for an average person. In a typical Japanese or Chinese diets, less than 5% of daily calories come from soybeans, which translates to only about 2 ounces per day. Now, there was another study that they used, and I'll uh, stop at this one. And this one mentioned that the diet containing the soy phytoestrogen, genistin, causes infertility in female rats. The study was performed on rats with genetic deficiencies. A soy isolate was used in high amounts to see whether it would induce infertility. So they already had an outcome in mind, and they created the situation to achieve that outcome. A soy isolate used in rats in high amounts. That does not seem like a regular human diet to me. And of course, not surprisingly, when you take a flawed, genetically deficient population of rodents, not humans, and induce them with much higher soy content than an average human diet would have, and you're going to use isolates, the results would be unfavorable. The rats in this study indeed turned out to be more infertile when fed very high amounts of soy isolates. I think that there is a cautionary tale to learn from this. Consuming soy isolates and supplements is not a great or healthy idea. Now, here's where I want you to really hear me out. While soybeans are not evil and have great and protective qualities... When they undergo processing and manipulation, truly bad things can and will happen. Soy isolates, just like isolates of any other foods, are not healthy and good news. They are largely used in many prepackaged foods you find on the market, including vegan faux foods and protein shakes and even infant formulas. Soy is also largely used as animal feed in factory farming. 
Mostly genetically modified beans are used in all of these instances. All of this leads to allergies, overconsumption of soy, and soy sensitivities. And when it comes to soy formulas, they are not a great product. Soy baby formula, while plant-based, is not much removed in quality from its counterpart, which is their infant formula. It is synthesized from corn syrup, safflower oil, and soy protein isolates. The protein the babies get comes from an isolate. The chemical compounds reach levels many times higher than the levels found in adults who consume whole soy products. They even exceed concentrations shown to be toxic in laboratory experiments. Soy and dairy-based formulas are packed with unfavorable ingredients and are very dangerous. There's nothing safer and better than the mother's breast milk. There are instances, of course, when the mother might not produce enough milk or in situations of adoption. In such situations, if possible, the parent should find the best breast milk bank and supplement with that. Now, I think we talked enough about common sense and experience and human experience and history here and even studies. The last thing that I do when looking at any research is I follow the money trail. I'm asking myself a question at all times, who stands to gain from this study? Unfortunately, science can be sold as much as it can be skewed. While there are honest but flawed studies performed frequently, leading to erroneous results, there are also studies that are funded by groups with vested interests. Remember how tobacco companies used to conduct their own studies on the safety of their products and even had medical doctors promote their products? We have not outlived those time, folks. Even to this day, the meat and dairy industries do exactly the same. Many of the research that casts negative light on soy products is funded by these industries. They're conducted in the ways to cast unfavorable light on soy and soy products, always adding to the bottom line of the investors. So whenever you look at any research, don't just go, oh my God, I just heard of a new research. This is what it says. Go and look, how was it conducted? How was it structured? How was it interpreted? Was it double blind study? Was it peer reviewed? Who funded the study? At the beginning of this podcast, I asked you a question that we ask ourselves all the time, to eat soy or not to eat soy. And now my friend, that you have enough evidence to draw your own conclusions, you should be able to answer that question. As you have seen and heard from me, soybeans and soy products are high in fat and high in protein. As such, we should consume them as we should any other calorie-rich foods such as nuts, avocados, and seeds. Occasionally, infrequently, but they do have a part in a well-rounded whole foods plant-based diet. Now, if you do not like soy or have a soy allergy, by no means is soy a necessity in your diet. You can include many other uh, legumes and other nuts in your diet to create the same effect that the soy would have on your body. You can always consume flax seeds and garlic and other foods rich in phytoestrogens. But if you're ready to experiment and you have no allergies, soy in its organic natural form is a great addition to your diet. Now, lastly, there's always the question about Is soy only beneficial when it's fermented or not fermented? Either one is fine. No one should create a religion around a food product. While some soy products like tempeh and miso are fermented and are very beneficial to our health and widely used in Japan, about half of the soy products are consumed unfermented. While in China, Hong Kong, and Singapore, nearly all soy products are consumed in and unfermented foods. That's a mouthful to say. Now, I hope that this podcast gives you enough ammunition to make an educated decision about the role of soy in your own personal diet and so that you are never again swayed by another poorly written article with somebody who has a preconceived notion about a specific topic. And with that said, of course, I hope that you enjoyed this podcast. If you did, I'm going to ask you a couple of things. First one, share it with a friend, share it with anybody that you care about. Second one, 
please go to your favorite podcasting platform and leave a five-star review for the Health Wizard podcast. The more reviews that we have, the more people I can reach with this good and simplifying news about how people from all over the world can achieve beautiful natural health of whether it's hormones, immune health, thyroid, or any other condition. If you are at a point that you are ready to take a huge leap forward in your health and you need support, remember that you can always reach out. Go to www.360impacthealth.com and shoot me a message. There's a contact form on the website where you can write to me and let me know. We have multiple options where we can support you on your health journey. We have programs, we have consultations, and we have our own app that you can enjoy where we share information such as this on a daily basis so that none of our clients are ever feeling confused or in the dark. Have a fantastic rest of the day, my beautiful soul. I will see you on the next episode of the Health Wizard podcast. There you have it. I hope you enjoyed today's topic. If you did, make sure to subscribe to the Health Wizard podcast and please don't forget to tell others about it. If you would like to get more information about me and what I do, how I help amazing human beings just like you to achieve their dream health, go to www.360impacthealth.com. Go to the contact page and shoot me a note. Thank you so much for listening. I'll catch you on the next episode of the Health Wizard Podcast. This is your host, Yelena, wishing you optimal natural health.